what property management companies tells you is you get a little thin line of data that comes to you. You have to look at that. It's hard to find it and ask questions, but you don't really know because don't tell the owner, don't tell the owner, don't tell the owner, right? And so now I just get it from my regional. They're like, here's what's going on. And so we can make better and cleaner decisions on getting stuff done. And uh, for me, that's been, uh, it's been, it's really been exhilarating. And, and to, to watch the team get it, right? And to watch different managers get it at different times. Folks, in any organization, communication is the hardest thing. Cross-pollination of ideas, knowledge, learnings. More, I mean, <laughs> those who don't pay attention to the learnings are doomed to repeat them, right? And, and as Corey just, just mentioned, if he has 11 properties and they're all in 11 silos and one has a problem that's rolling across the nation, well, they're probably all going to experience it and have to learn how to solve it separately if they aren't doing that communication. So that, that's encouraging. You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we're all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, Chad, the investment maverick. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton. Great to be with you here today. I'm going to bring back an OG from early in the show, back in episode 20, 020, go way back in the archives. My friend, Corey Peterson, the big kahuna. This guy is an incredible businessman. He's an incredible human. Uh, I've spent some time with him in person recently. It just It's amazing to hear some of the stuff he's overcome, what he's doing and you know how he's he has a different mindset on insourcing property management than I do. So I'd love to to bring you know diverse views to this show and let you hear different opportunities and how people structure their businesses and just learn from this great human. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. But before we do, if you get any value out of this show, just like it, subscribe it, think about two people who need to hear it, hit that share button on your phone, just interact with it in some way so that the algorithm knows you like it. We don't pay to produce this stuff. Well, we do We do pay to produce it. We don't pay to market it. And it's all about giving back. So please have that giver mindset, that giver heart, and just add value to someone else who needs to hear what this episode says today. So without further ado, here is Corey Peterson. So, Corey, what have you been up to since the last time we got together on the show, brother? It has been a crazy journey, but we decided uh, at the beginning, really a year and a half ago, to vertically integrate, to basically take on property management. And and there's a couple of reasons why. One is, you know, when interest rates started going up and all the things, all the craziness in the market happened, you know, I feel like we're pretty good operators. Yeah. Um, but there's things outside of your control. When insurance goes up 100 to 200% in some markets and interest rates go all the way up to your cap rates, um, you really start looking at the one thing that you can you can control, which is your expenses. Yes. And when you look at property management, sometimes they are not yoked with you in the right, correct way when it comes to managing expenses because they get paid on collections, right? Total revenue collected. So that's the only number they care about. And a lot of times they will spend you to the poorhouse. And so we saw this and we have enough portfolio. I think we have uh, we have like the 11 active assets, right? And so the question we had was, can we bring it in? And do we have enough money and fees to build the machine? And um, we thought about it long and hard. And again, I remember I sat with uh, my controller and my uh, my COO, and I was like, "Do we want to do this? Is this something we want to take on? Because this is going to be it's major, the <laughs> right?" And uh, and so we said, "Yeah, we said yeah." So we put it, we put the pieces in place, um, and now we're about a year and a half into it. And looking back, I, I have so many podcasts where I said, "Don't ever do this. Don't ever do it. I'll never do it." And here I am doing it, right? Probably, Chad, the best decision I've ever made. Ever made. 
that that's incredible. And I have so many questions. So we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit. So, it, you know, we won't, we won't throw any names under the bus here. So, you know, I know you had a major firm. We'll say that. So we're not talking mm-hmm. that the Corey did not have a couple of rinky dink, small property managers. He had a major national firm who you would know the name. We're going to respect it and not say it on the, on the air, but, um, so, so let's just kind of take that one out of it. You know, he definitely had what was supposedly the cream of the crop in place and still chose to do this. And I, I'm really eager for this to be, for this discussion because I'm, I'm in that camp. Like I, I see what my management teams do day to day. I'm like, gosh, I do not want the headache of that operational, just, just the head count for one thing, dealing with the head count and the procedures and the policies and the compliance and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But question number one um, so you kind you kind of poked on expenses a little bit, right? So, so what was the, I mean, was there a certain area of the expense line or like, what did you see? Like, wow, I can do this better. Like, what was the, what was the initial tipping point that really uh, set you on the so path? I'm in student housing. About 70% of my portfolio is student housing. So we, we that I did not know that's a niche. <laughs> yep. We service college kids. We run it by the bed and we button up next to colleges, right? Um, we didn't. Ten, or we didn't say go out and say we're going to be student house and then we just kind of fell into a niche yeah yeah and we just started finding the right deals and right deals and right deals and so it was like well okay we'll, we'll, and we got good at it right but um turn it's called turn uh, all your housing moves out and in in a matter of three weeks right yes that is the, by the way that is the niche of student housing if you miss leasing season you're going to sit vacant for most of the most of the semester it's crazy ask me if i've done that before right yes i've made this <laughs> mistake right and then you have to live and grin and bear it right but um, the beautiful thing is if you do it right um it's it's a beautiful gift right because it'll it's like do that one time and then we actually spend we start releasing in october and we just we have our our progress but um, the best example I can give you, we had this one property, it's $40 million asset, really nice uh, property, 632 beds, beautiful property in Pennsylvania. The year that this other management company had it, they spent $330,000 on term, which was way more than we budgeted for. And it was just like, what in the world, right? And so this year we did turn, we spent 130, right? now. How did we spend that much less, right? Because we still had to do the same amount of work, right? But the difference is instead of outside vendoring everything, right, we decided to be smart. We're like, listen, a lot of kids right after May and they're done, they start to move out, right? Let's go ahead and we hired some 15 an hour college kids and they were now our cleaning crew where it was getting outside vendored. And then we realized, hey, they can take out all the nails in the, you know, drywall. And hey, they can actually take some dap and and put and fill the nail holes back up. And then they can kind of lightly sand it. And guess what? They can run a paintbrush and uh and do that too, if you give them the right directions. And so we just started saving money left and right, and we were getting in these things early to where and then you know you know what cleans carpets? What's that? Dad, effort, <laughs> <laughs> effort and chemical. A little bit of chemical, yeah. a little bit more effort, right? That's what cleans carpets and a decent commercial carpet cleaner, which we bought because why why sub that out too? So we just started. You know, I always ask like, well, can we do that? And that was our whole premises on ten other assets, right? And it saved us almost a million dollars, right, in cost. And so that's that was the that was the why because I felt like we could do that better. And then that's not even talking all the ancillary fees that they charge you. Like they want to charge you for copiers papers at their office, corporate office. You get like there's a little line, copier papers, right? So anything they print it, they count it. And um, it was just like, dude, because they say, oh, it's the 3% asset management fee or 3, 3, 3% property management fee, plus, 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 right? And, but that's not even the biggest part, Chad. I would say saving money was great. That's, you now what I, so as the journey went, what I found though, the whole difference maker, Chad, we are in the people business. I mean, Agreed that's what on that. we really do. 
right? And so we affect communities. And this is people's, this is their home. Like this is where they go home at night. They don't look at it as it's my apartment or whatever. It's, it's their home, right? And so if we understand that and then we get people uh, to learn our culture and the way we want to take care of the people that live in their homes that we provide, everything changes. So we went hard on developing company culture, who we are, who we are not, what's our core values, right? And so now that's how we hire. And that was the biggest piece of this, Chad, that I didn't think that I would like is when I first did, I was like, dude, I'm going to go from, you know, five employees to 64 employees. Very quickly. Like, I'm like, does that, that's going to make my brain hurt, right? Um, but Chad, what I, what I realized is that I actually love it. I really love mm. that journey of taking these young, because they're pretty young, you know, and teaching them culture and giving them something to work for. Because people work way harder because it means something than just for a dollar. And once we changed that paradigm, then we had people bleeding kahuna red, right? And so I'll, I'll leave you. So we have this thing, we call it the Dekind attitudes. Like the Bible has the B attitudes, right? And right. Um, we, we call ours the Dekind attitudes. And number one, these are all Hawaiian pigeon words because it's the kahuna style, right? Which is fun. But number one is like, be the kind. Like we want you to show up, show out, be special, the kind, right? Our second one is give them, give them, bro, right? That's like, go for it. Try your best. Like you see some Hawaiians on out there, one guy surfing, they're like, give them, bro, right? Go for it. Try your best. Um, be Ohana, right? We want people, we want good people, like good hearts, right? We're looking for that, right? Um, Rock said, uh, well, and Rock said, you know, family, no one gets left behind, right? Spread aloha. Like, be loving also, right? Give it out, right? And then the last one is we want to make it mo' better. Make mo it better. a mo' better. We will always be a work in progress, right? And, oh, and then, wait, I forgot the other one, choke praise. We give choke praise. If you do it right, you have choke beers, right? But uh, choke is a lot of or a bunch of, right? And so we just developed this identity of the Kahuna brand and what it represents, and then we use that to propel our teams. And then we would actually bring our teams to corporate and love on them and spread the aloha, right? And get them to buy in with, you know, A, my, my rags to riches story. I was just like you guys. I'm not special, right? And show them the identity of who we are. And then they go back to their sites and they crush it. And my friend Chad, that has been the best gift that I could have ever had to watch them go out and succeed. And then to, to be able to start promoting from within. It's lovely. The, the amazing thing you just articulated there is the culture that you've built. Right. And so you, you, you were so wise to focus on the culture of the people and like, make sure they feel ownership and love and, and the va I mean, you, you, you did it in such a fun way, by the way, those on video, I just turned my Hawaiian hat around to kind of be part of the club here with my, my shaka right here. So anyway, yeah, from uh, all the way from the island of Kauai back in uh, back in February, but um, but you know back to the back to the point. Um, Corey realized that if he's going to insource this major operation, which is people heavy, he's going to have to make them promote from within, right? And so I love everything he just said about the people aspect of it. And so let, so let's talk about the organization for a second because. You know, if you're coming from a large property management group and you think you may want to insource this, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you it's not going to be very easy, right? And Corey can probably attest to that. It's going to take some planning, but let's talk about how you set it up because so that not only are there, if you just think about the people, there's the managers and, and maybe assistant managers on site. You're going to have one or two leasing or, uh, uh, maintenance people, depending on the size of the property. Um, you know, you're going to have vendor support. You're going to have maybe some back office functions, marketing type things to hit those leasing seasons. So, so how did you choose to structure the company? Because just, just with what you just told me, I got to imagine you probably looked at how they're usually structured and kind of came up with what you think is a better way. So. I don't know if I did that, but I probably think I just bootstrapped it and went on. <laughs> I wish I would say 
I was more methodical in the beginning, but I wasn't. <laughs> I was just like, we got to get rid of this this company. They're killing us, right? So it was really, it was my controller. I had a really good controller that mm -hmm. I knew could do accounting. And so we had to build an accounting team. That was the first step. Like, I'm like, we can't get accounting right. We can't do anything. That's right. So we, that we started there. We got to make sure that we, we hired a couple of staff accountants that were already in the property business. Um, and then, um, and then we worked on another kind of AP person, right? So that was our accounting silo. We're like, boom, okay, we got that. Can we handle that? I think we can, you know, just enough. And then, so then we had to go. So that was the first step. Then we said, um, let's have a, I call her a COO, but she really would be like an SVP or a, a senior vice president of her operations for the management side. And then a regional or two underneath her, right? And so that was like, so there's that. So that's kind of the corporate side of things. Me and my wife, we were the marketing part of that. And we understood it enough. And yeah. we just we just started working with the vendors, right? So we already, these properties were already running. So it's not mm -hmm. like we started from scratch. They already had a lot of the things involved. And most of the accounts were already set up. So we already had like our vendors and stuff like that already set up. But some of those were already were tied to the other property management company. So then we had to learn, oh, we need to change that. And, uh, and it was just a... We kept on, you know, solving for problems as you go. That's kind of the entrepreneurship prize. I don't know, but I'm going, so we'll we'll see what happens. That's kind of how we did it. I'd like to say we were more methodical about it, but Chad, what we realize is our version one is better than version none, right? That's right. And we will make it more better, right? So we didn't have any processes, right? SOPs, right? So then that became our second thing. So once we kind of had our structure of Property management or SVP, two regionals, and then at the site level, you usually have a property manager, a leasing agent, a CA. We call them CAs. These are community ambassadors. These are your college kids, 12 bucks an hour, right? And then a maintenance supervisor and a maintenance tech, right? So that's about five people at every property average. Some people, bigger properties have a couple more, uh, maybe uh, some kind of janitorial or a porter type of thing, right? But that's that's in the gist of what each location has. And then we had to, you know, we had to hire regionals in the geographical areas to kind of make it make sense. So then we started looking at where do you, where do these, you know, find someone that lives in Houston or, you know, um, you know, airports that are easy to get it, get to and go and fly to our assets, right? So it was a little bit of a mess and and, and honestly we <clears throat> we are still working at it and getting better but if i look at the whole best thing i've ever done because i know i i have so much more insight of what's going on at the properties that my friend is the real juice that's worth the squeeze i know what's going on because usually what property management companies tells you is you get a little thin line of data that comes to you you have to look at that hard to find it and ask questions but you don't really know because don't tell the owner, don't tell the owner, don't tell the owner, right? And so now I just get it from my region. They're like, here's what's going on. And so we can make better and cleaner decisions on getting stuff done, right? And uh, for me, that's been, uh, it's been, it's really been exhilarating. And, and to, to watch the team get it, right? And to watch different managers get it at different times, right? So we have this one manager that crushes it. So we use her as our example. And so when we're going through P&Ls with a, another property, like, hold on, let me just show you, you know, Madison's numbers, right? Your property's 511 beds or 532. She's 511. Let me show you what she's running in her cost, right? And we just go and show them. And they're like, oh. And I said, well, why is it? Because Madison, you know, she doesn't even um, have carpet guys install the carpet. She just orders the carpet from Lowe's to the exact measurements that she needs and her maintenance guys install it. And yeah, they have a, you know they have the tools. They went and bought a kicker. They got a stretcher. Um, because now a carpet's two hundred bucks yeah. instead of a thousand or five hundred or six hundred, right? Yeah. Or usually yeah. it's about four fifty, right, for a bed or something, three hundred bucks a bed. But but we get it for two hundred bucks. And so it's just like those little things and learning. And then we you know we started also 
sharing information. This was the other big thing. Before, everybody was on an island. You got to think these properties. Now, I'm all over in different states with student housing. So it's not like I'm concentrated in one market. That's the only downside to doing student is you don't normally be in one market. You're usually in multiple different markets, right? Um, if I could do it over again, I mean, we're looking to go back into just regular multifamily to get back to 50-50, right? Yeah. I like multifamily too. I like just, it's a monthly pace, right? But with the students, um, what we saw is, I lost my train of thought here. Um, you were uh, talking about cost. how spread out you are and, and how, yeah, we were talking about cost and how spread out you are because you're in student housing rather than conventional, right? Yeah, I'm having a senior moment. I just turned 50. Forgive me, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've learned is that, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you if you can manage your team well and have the right locations for them, they'll they'll just you'll get so much more out of them, right? And just learning to oh, that's what it was the Slack, the islands, right? That's what was going on. No one, no properties were talking to themselves. Like we, there was not a collaboration of anything. Every property manager didn't talk to any other assets that I own. I was like, I always thought that was weird. And so we're like, dude. So we we introduced Slack, right? Or a lot of people you people use Microsoft Teams, mm -hmm. but our Slack, we have a general tab in our Slack, and everybody posts there, and it's like everybody's talking. Oh, that's a great idea. These baskets or this little thing or this little event, and everybody percolates and 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 shows up there, and so that connects the team even better and tighter too, right? Which I think that that is the piece that we were missing is they didn't have anybody that they could talk to outside of their regional. Now, if they have a real problem and they know that Madison just did this or it is a Southern property manager, they'll just go direct and call that, that person. So now we are gelled as a team. We're not on islands. And again, the flow of information, SOPs and how we do it gets better and better. That's amazing. And, and folks, in any organization, communication is the hardest thing. Cross-pollination of ideas, knowledge, learnings. More, I mean, <laughs> those who don't pay attention to the learnings are doomed to repeat them, right? And, and as Corey yeah. just, just mentioned, if he has 11 properties and they're all in 11 silos and one has a problem that's rolling across the nation, well, they're probably all going to experience it and have to learn how to solve it separately if they aren't doing that communication. So yeah. that, that's encouraging. And, and I love the, the application of Slack or teams or something like it. I mean, that is, um, we've done that in our business, uh, for, I'm, I'm hearing some things that you were complaining about your management company about. I'm like, okay, well, good. Our team's doing this, our team's doing this. So maybe we have one of the better companies. I don't know, but, um, at the end of the day, it's something that you will never get when you are, using third parties. I mean, and, and so the benefit is let, let's just say all things are equal. Let's say that there is, you have the ability to run the properties at the same level that a third party management company has. Let's say you're at that level, right? We are not at that level. I don't think we can handle that right now. But if, um, if, if you were the one thing you're never going to get with third party is recapturing those revenue streams, right? You may, you may even feel like you have full control. You may even, you know, be able to keep costs down and things of that sort. That's all possible with, with correct, uh, the right management team and the right oversight. But how has, how has the recapturing of revenue streams impacted your business, you know, in a positive way? Because I guess that would be not only fees, but the general management fee, one-off fees, uh, payroll is probably about the same. Maybe it's, maybe it's more efficient. I don't know. What are your thoughts? It's there? actually better. I feel like we were getting charged a premium on payroll for their like workman's comp and stuff. So my, my, so those, so some of those fees went down, um, you know, and then you, yes. So as a property management company, now I make a couple, I make a little extra money, but like, it's not a profit center for me. I just use my profit that I make to buy more people. Human buy capital bigger, investment. More staff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I've never looked at my property management company as a, it only services my company, by the way. Like I don't third party out to anybody I and never, I never will. That, that I will never do. <laughs> I would never have two masters, right? And so it's built to do, be a slave to Kahuna Investments, right? But in that, um, we just look at it as, I mean, I take, I don't take a huge salary. I take a small salary as compared. And that's just my salary from that. And everything else buys what it needs or sets money aside to do 
events. Like, so we're, we're working on maybe trying to create a winner's circle, right? Where we get to take um, the certain key staff, property managers, maintenance supervisor, we're making, um, this is what we're doing this year for this next season. So we're going to take them to Hawaii, right? That'll be amazing. And yes. And so those are the things that I'd rather invest in. Again, it comes around people. That's one of my favorite things that I like to do is give that gift, right? And um, to show them a little something that they may, maybe not have seen, give them that experience that they've never had before. Does that make them more loyal? You know, I think so. I would say um, so. But does I mean, it make it, it, and even if it didn't, and even if it didn't, right, does it make me happy? Yes, it does, right? I don't need to make any more money, right, Chad? I, I make many, I make plenty. I don't need to make any more money, but I love playing the game, right? And so if I love playing the game, then play it well and, and share and, and teach and coach and bring people along and show them the way, right? And to me, that's, that's more about what the journey is about for me is one to three deals a year. One's fine. Two's great. Three would be, you know, ludicrous speed, but that's all I got to do. One or two deals a year. Pretty happy with that. Um, we're even selling some of our old deals, like deals that we're really crushing. Um, that there's other deals that are in our portfolio that we're just going out and going to be buying out some of my investors out of it, right? Because my whole goal is to become a family office, right? Where I own it all. And so to do that, I got to own all of my deals, right? So we're selling some of our deals. Instead of going and buying new deals, it's like, let's just go buy out and do a capital call and just buy out all the investors out of this one thing. And now we own it. Kahuna owns it completely. And it's a great, and we already know the ones that are great. So yeah. let's just do that. Yeah, I love that. And, and I mean, you said so much there. Just, I mean, if you can do nothing else, folks, having the ability to invest in human capital and grow human talent. I mean, look, you're going to get turnover. Any business, people are going to grow and they're going to leave and go. To, I mean, they may decide they're going to become the next big kahuna. I mean, there may be that and that happens too. But I mean, gosh, I, I got to imagine if you're pouring into your people like that and you're bringing them together and you're loving on them and you're taking them to Hawaii. I mean, what other company does that? You know, so that's that's a pretty great loyalty thing. And, and you know, what what Corey hasn't mentioned here, because he's very astute at developing and, and retaining his people, it seems like turnover is expensive in people, right? When you have to reach constantly retrain and, and market for someone and all that, it's best to just keep the talent you have happy. It will get the right talent first. I mean, you don't want the wrong talent. Amen. Get, getting the right talent and then keeping them happy, you know? Um, gosh, I, I love this discussion, Corey, so hey, much. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'm, I'm going to give you a mistake that I made. Let me give Let's you a mistake, it. okay? In, in this property, and so this is recently too, right? So this is something I recently just had to do. And it's called the Peter Principle. So if you Google the Peter Principle, and this is what happened, right? So obviously you go to the war with the team you have, right? Mm -hmm. And when I went and started this management company, I had uh, some people, um, I had my controller and I had uh, another person, I'm not going to name her name, but she was somewhat qualified, but I, that's the team I had and she was willing. She's like, let's go. And that was what we needed, right? But I over-promoted her. I gave her a title and responsibilities that she had never been there before. Okay? And so, and this, was, this is a hard one. I mean, this, this just happened a couple weeks ago, right? I had to let that person go. And the reason is we have developed now into a company and the management team is it demands this certain skill set. And and it's it's around it's more. Um, this person was a people person, right? A go get it, um, more of a shotgun approach. Like Corey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be your soldier. I'm gonna go in and I'm I'm gonna whip stuff up, right? But she wasn't very analytical, right? And the role that she was truly in at the higher level is much more of an analytical role, right? So as we started getting through, it was great, right? Getting everybody up and running and stuff. But then the cracks started to form when it wasn't just a full circle. It was just one of these little, you know, this here. Then it was another, oh, wait, here, there's another thing right there. And um, at the end of the day, Chad, that was my fault. I, and I learned a big lesson on that in, in, in hiring and promoting someone way higher than their skill level, skill uh, level. I set her up to fail. And I feel horrible for it, by the way. Yeah. Right. 
because when you let someone go that is that caliber and you're paying them a, a lot of pay, that sucks. So there's there's another part of being a business owner and doing that and having to let people go when they're not right. Uh, that's not a great feeling. So there's there's pros and cons to being and owning a you know a big business owner. And normally my department heads would do this, but this was at a level that I had to do it right. And I will say that it was it was you know my fault for doing that. I mean, I had to live with the consequences. Now, but the the other side of that is that I found the right person and she fits perfectly in that spot. And guess what? Everything's getting mo better, right? And so as a company, the company has to work. The company has to win. And so when I put my company hat on, I'm a business owner at the end of the day, right? And Business owners, business has to be savage sometimes. You have to be a savage. And, and unfortunately, that's the way it is. Because if the business doesn't win, if it fails, then everybody loses a job. That's right. Right? And so my job is to make sure that we do not ever get to that point. And so that requires hard decisions. And I have had to have new skill sets. I've had to become a better CEO. Where I used to be, you know, in my office by myself. Now I've got teams. So what have I been doing? Chad, I've been reading so many books about being a better leader, uh, CEO books, right? Um, there's a great book by Trey Taylor called The CEO Does Three Things, which is numbers, culture, and people. And dude, those are the three things that I truly, that book changed, that really helped me a lot. I need to know all my numbers for all my properties. I need to be in, in control of my culture, which I am. And then I need to be responsible for my people. And so I interview almost all of our, our people initially. And it's a big investment in my time, but it's a big investment in our company as well. That's beautiful. And, and it, you know, it, it just all comes back to the fact that, you know, everyone's got to get new skill sets when you're building a new company, including the leader. and you know, selecting the right people, growing the right people, and then continuing to invest in those people is going to lead you to success. And, and one thing that you mentioned early in the episode that I think uh, we, we kind of breeze by it, but I want to bring it back and just make sure everyone heard it. If you think you're ready to insource property management, first of all, think about it because it is a major undertaking. You've heard us hit on just a few things. It is major operational culture and it is a major key operation to your portfolio. So make sure you know what you're doing. But Corey also mentioned, don't get into analysis paralysis. You're going to know enough about it. You know, you're going to make some mistakes and figure out, oh, gee, I need to write SOPs. And you're going to have some of those moments along the way. You're never going to get it perfect, but version was better than version none. But if you think you're going to do this strictly to create another profit stream, in general, property management companies are cost centers, not profit centers, until you reach a certain scale. And that scale is big, all right? Like, you know, tens of 10 to 20,000 units. You can get pretty profitable. And I'm, I'm going to speak generally on what I've seen of, of other companies that I've kind of looked into their books on this. You can get pretty profitable in one area with about five to 700 units in one area. At least that was two years ago when I studied this. Um, Corey may have another opinion, so I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna let him speak on that as well. But just remember, you're not doing this for another revenue stream. You're doing this for control, transparency, and and as Corey mentioned, the little pennies make dimes. Those make dollars. If you can start saving pennies across the board because you have your fingers and everything, okay. Amen. That's that. That is the God honest truth. It is not a big profit center, right? I mean, I I make a. I'll tell you, I make a hundred thousand dollars. That's what I make off of my management company. That's it. That's all the salary I take for sixty right? additional employees and and <laughs> operations and all that. <laughs> That's it, right? So um, I can make more if I wanted to, but I, I like I would I take and we, and the company still makes a profit, but salary wise. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that's all. I, that's all I decided I wanted to make because I'm not about it. It really is about all the other things you said, Chad. That services are main core business, right? So I'm okay with that, right? So as long as it, you know it makes money, uh, you know, we. This is something. Uh, this is maybe a, something most people don't understand, but 
I'll, I'll say it. So I can't remember what book this is, Profit First, but like um, we have like five or six business ac accounts for even the management company, right? Yeah. So we do this because all money comes into our operations account and then we start sweeping money every month. We sweep money for um, bonuses, right? End of the year bonuses, right? I have an account set up called bonuses, right? Money just gets sweeped, right? Because I just learned if if we keep the the bucket of money in one spot, that like an operations bucket, it gets spent. So if we sweep it over, then all of our little things get kind of, you know, we have a, a continuing education is another account, right? For staff, or whatever. We have another one for, for um, uh, events, right? Or like annual events, right? So we do all these things because that's how you, that's how you keep your money rolling. And I don't think a lot of people understand that, but for us, Anytime we have another, like, oh, we need to do something, we'll create another account and start sweeping money into that for whatever it is that we want to do. And then after the day, you can look at it like, oh, we've got blankety dollars in this, right? So at the end of the year, when it's Christmas time, I'm not trying to figure out how I'm going to um, give everybody bonuses. I've already thought about that way in advance. Yeah. We've already got it sweeping. We've had it sweeping all year. It's like, this is awesome. I'm going to get ready to spread some love on the people. Beautiful. I love that, Corey. We're going to let that be the mic drop moment for the day. We're at the end of the episode. Before we go, you know, we, we've done the quattro questions with you, so I'm not going to make you do them again, but I just love to kind of throw an open end to one because I know you can handle it. Um, you know, last over the last 18 months since we've talked on this show, just, you know, tell me maybe some highlights of what you felt, where you see we're going, you know, commiserate with us for a second, but also shed some light on where you see things going. It's been the hardest two years of my life, right? Uh, rates rates going up crazy, interest rates going up 100, 200% has been the most challenging business uh, endeavors that I've ever had to face, truly, right? Um, and so I'm looking at it as I'm just a dollar, dollar cost averaging at this point, right? I bought some stuff like, a couple of years ago that I thought was going to be, you know, it's going to be, they're going to be base hits. They're, they were triples or home runs and now they're base hits. And I'm okay with that. Because you never know. I've, I've learned this as well, Chad, is you never know when you're going to hit home runs. So you just keep buying. And I look at right now as a great little market. I just bought a, a bank-owned property, Chad, REO, in receivership. I bought it for $7 million at a price for 8.4. 95% occupied. It's cash flowing out the gate. Why? Because someone lost it, right? And I picked it up cheap. And, I yep. still, and I'm still at 8.67% rate. Right, and I'm still cash flowing. Why? Because they, the numbers had to make sense for the bank to sell. Yeah. Right. So I'm very optimistic about what's going forward. Um, I will tell you this for anybody listening: this still is the best business ever. Like, I've also had properties where I bought it for nine million and I sold it for nineteen three years later. Like, so I don't have a magic wand, but I I know that if you hold real estate long enough, you always win. Yes. And so, and there's. And the fundamentals have never changed, Chad. In fact, they've gotten better. So the time is now to be in real estate, in my opinion. And uh, it will always be. And it, it's as long as it's your passion, if you know that this is the thing, because, Chad, I don't even pay taxes. I've not paid taxes in a long time. And that's a big deal. So I love real estate. I'm just telling you, anybody that's listening on this podcast, this is a great show. You do a great job as a host and teaching and getting good content out. But if you're thinking about doing real estate, this this is a great time to jump in. Water's warm. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and like, it, just just to kind of accentuate what you said, like over the last two years, it, there's been some of the hardest decisions we've had to deal with of, of you know uncontrollables changing faster than you can react. But guess what? If you took all that out, like took the debt stuff out, took the insurance stuff out, took the property tax stuff out, yada yada yada, and you just went to the property operations. The property operations, the fundamentals, they have been improving steadily. Now we're not getting 15% organic rent raises right now. So that we're kind of back to normal on that. But the yep. fundamentals have been great. So, and, and just like I always say, I probably beat it till it's blue in the face, folks. You only get in trouble in this business if you run out of two things, time or money. And that's what's been happening lately is there's been loans coming due, people running out of time and interest rates where you, people had unhedged floating rate risk and things of that sort. 
it's caused them to run out of money, <laughs> right? So that's yep. what causes yep. distress. If you set everything you do up, like don't buy anything for two minutes that you wouldn't want to hold for 10 years, right? Warren Buffettism. And if you set it up that way, you're going to be fun. I'm telling you. So, that is it, dude. That is it. Corey, thank you for coming on the show, brother. I always enjoy our conversations, your wisdom, and, and just uh, you're always a pioneer trying new things, man. So I appreciate you sharing the nuggets with us. Can I share my book real quick? Oh, yes. We didn't do that question. So please share the book. I wrote a new book called Trust But Verify, The Passive Investor's Guide to Evaluating Real Estate Syndicators. People like me and you, Chad. Uh, if you text the word trust to 480-500-1127, we will send you the book for free. But it's a great book to show and ask the questions of how should I vet a Chad and Corey? What questions should I ask? Uh, because a lot of, I think there's a lot of people out there that they know they don't trust the stock market. Look at what Warren Buffett's doing. He's taking all that kind of money out, brother. Right. And um, I think people understand that they want to take better control of their capital. The time is now to do it. That's this absolutely cool. right, folks. And if you're driving or if you're doing something else right now, just scroll down on whatever you're watching this on. This will be in the show notes for your clicking pleasure. Our wonderful editor, Kyle, is going to make sure of that. So Kyle, there's your, there's your blip. And if he doesn't do it, we're going to fire him. Let me know in the comments. All right. So <laughs> just kidding, Kyle. Love you, brother. All right, folks, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Until next time, over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com and scroll down for more info. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway podcast.